You are listening to the Be The Bridge podcast with Latasha Morrison. How are you guys doing today? It's exciting. Each week, Be The Bridge podcast tackles subjects related to race and culture with the goal of bringing understanding. But I'm going to do it in the spirit of love. We believe understanding can move us toward racial healing, racial equity, and racial unity. Latasha Morrison is the founder of Be The Bridge, which is an organization responding to racial brokenness and systemic injustice in our world. This podcast is an extension of our vision to make sure people are no longer conditioned by a racialized society, but grounded in truth. If you have not hit the subscribe button, please do so now. Without further ado, let's begin today's podcast. Oh, and stick around for some important information at the end. Rainbow, you have black, so you black. But I'm also half white. That might be scientifically accurate, but science has no place in the real world. You black. I know, but I'm white too. That was a clip from ABC's popular TV show, Mixed Dish. Mixed Dish explores life through the lens of a biracial preteen girl named Bo, which is short for Rainbow. Bo is raised with her brother and sister in the 80s by her parents, one being white and the other being black. Today, we will be discussing what it means to be biracial in America. I was able to begin to unpack this subject through two separate conversations I had with two women who happened to be biracial, Shannon Doyle Bell and Letitia Willer. Both Shannon and Letitia were raised by black fathers and white mothers. Both are wives and mothers themselves. Shannon is an accomplished TV producer who is also one of the hosts of the podcast, Mixed Life ATL. Letitia is a successful author of the book, Half Breed. The first thing a biracial person must grapple with is what makes them who they are. I asked Shannon, what makes her who she is? Shannon's answer is fascinating. Let's hear her answer. Um, And... I I like to include the cities when I talk about who I am um, because it's def- they they've all been instrumental in who I am. It's another whole layer of diversity and um, culture and whatnot that's added to my story and the makeup of who I am. So I you know and and Grand Rapids, Michigan, West Michigan. I know you know a few people there um, is where I you know grew up, and so okay <laughs> <there> too. <laughs> Um, so going from there to then Los Angeles to then Brooklyn to (laughs) Atlanta, you know, I mean, it's, um, there's a lot going on and it's given me, uh, really good perspective on people again with my, you know, little sociology background that I, um, studied in college. I just loved to learn about people and, um, what makes them who they are. There's a theme I think you're going to pick up on. Um, Check out Letitia's answer as we delve we'll more into more her into upbringing. This, but I, I moved around in my younger years quite a bit through my um, elementary, middle school, high school years. And so I lived in three different states. I lived in the Pacific Northwest. I lived in Texas. I lived in Louisiana. I had the opportunity to live in rural areas in the country and the city and the suburbs. And I lived in low income housing up to a house with a swimming pool and everything in between. And those states were different politically. They were different socioeconomically. They were different culturally. And through not only my own family dynamic of white and black and having white aunts, uncles and white cousins and white, black I'm sorry, and black cousins and aunts and, um, you know, grandparents. I also culturally lived among different people groups as well. And so through my life journey, I, you know, developed these relationships and these experiences really on both sides of the spectrum, in essence, you could say. Family members that were Catholic and some were Baptist and some were Methodist and some were non-denominational and some were voted Democrat and some voted Republican and Um, you know, on on different spectrums, right? And so I had to learn to navigate being on both sides of the bridge in essence. Yeah. I would love to hear just a little bit about that story and journey um, that you had with your your father um, as you navigated this. That's probably one of my most favorite stories I place in the book. In fact, as I wrote that, I had tears streaming down my face and so like you said, I was born in 1980. And yes, I was the oldest. I was the oldest of four girls. And so 
they, you know, like you said, they're trying to navigate. My dad was raised in the segregated Black South in a country town that it was very clear of what side of the tracks you were from. And my mother was an army brat in essence. And so she moved around quite often from different army bases. And so her world was a little bit more diverse, Um, but she ultimately was raised in the Pacific Northwest, which is very different from, you know, the rural black South. And so I was five years old. At this point, I lived in Houston. We lived in Houston, Texas. And I want to say it was probably the inner city portion of Houston. We live in the black neighborhood. And I don't recall what happened or what was said leading up to this very moment. But I, it was a, it's a pivotal moment that defined my life really going forward. And it was, I remember my father saying, Tisha, who is better, black or white? And now, mind you, I'm only five, <laughs> right? Right. And I remember saying to him, I remember thinking this answer is so obvious. And I said to him, white. So he proceeds to turn me around and he spanks me on my bottom. He turns me back around and he says, Tisha, who's better, black or white? So now I'm thinking, well, it's really obvious now. I know what he wants me to say. So I say black. Mm -hmm. He turns me around and he spanks me again. And he says, Tisha, who is better? And I said, neither. And he said, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And that is in essence how my father raised us in knowing you're not one or the other, you're both, and to equally love both cultures that you, that in essence, that's in your DNA, that God made you. And I know that is a unique story and a unique journey because I have had multiple biracial friends in being half black and half white, where, like you said earlier, Maybe the father was missing and he was on, the child was only raised by their mother, maybe their white mother. And so maybe the black father wasn't around like Obama, right? That he, in essence, it was just one family member or, or vice versa. Yeah. Where they were only raised with their black and not their white. And I would say overwhelmingly majority of my biracial friends, half white, and half black, truly would identify with one or the other and not both equally like we were raised. And so I know that's a very unique story, but I also felt like that story, in essence, at that point in my life, it helped me decide, am I going to live in bondage for the rest of my life where I'm always constantly believing that once one part of me is not equal to the other, right? right. Or live in shame or guilt, but one, one or the other. But mm-hmm. that is, in essence, how we, we were raised and we grew up. We equally loved both of our cultures. Mm -hmm. I was raised, you know, I I got to both my sets of my grandparents, my dad's black family, my, my big mama, we affectionately call my grandmother, big mama Mm -hmm. raised 15 kids in a segregated black South. She, I have probably 45, 50 first cousins, 60 something second cousins. And so I got to know her and my family very well. You know, we ate sweet potato pie at Big Mama's house, Mm -hmm. but yet at my German grandmother's house, we had pumpkin pie Mm -hmm. and we listened to music on both sides and we we engaged in food and conversation, you know, on both sides. And so we were very um, fortunate, very blessed to be able to equally enjoy both cultures. People who are biracial are not a monolith, making their upbringings varied. Check out Shannon's thoughts on the same subject of upbringing. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody's family on this, okay. but I feel when you're when you are born into a family and you're biracial. We were talking. I, I was always asking questions. Ron and I both actually talk about how we think that that definitely spearheaded our careers and wanting to tell people stories and wanting to understand people just period because we were just, uh, you know, always asking questions and, mm-hmm. and putting our parents on the spot and them not having the answers because no one's going to tell them there's not a book, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, a lot of times they got it wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of times. Right. Right. And, right. and I think it's huge to, when you have a, the biracial experience of being, of me growing up as a, black woman with a white mother is Mm -hmm. huge. And I feel like she and I are still like dissecting it. Okay. Okay. Because um, you have to have a lot of truth and not take it personal. I think, you know, she would say, and I hate to talk for her, but I had, there was a lot of times where it would almost feel, you know, it would be sensitive because if, if someone were to say, you know, look at 
her and not think that I'm her child, you know, mm-hmm. strangers or, you know, um, that type of thing or think that she's the nanny or something like that. Right. Um, those type of things are, are hurtful or on the flip side, then, you know, hate on or, um, you know, those type of negative feelings towards her and her children and her family. Right. Um, it's, it's new. Um, someone right. tells me, you know, you, when you step into that, you're giving up a little bit of white privilege. And I had mm-hmm. never thought about that. That was something I like kind of looked at when I was a little bit, a lot older, I mm-hmm. should say. Um, I think, uh, it's, I think there's tension with that. For right. Me. Right. Um, right. And she, she grew up in a Christian family. Her father was a pastor of a mm-hmm. Lutheran church and he had started, he had planted like 14, 13 or 14 churches all over the Midwest and East coast and, um, and you know, youngest of four. And then my dad's, you know, one of seven new, very New York bred, um, mm-hmm. Trinidad and Tobago, Caribbean background. And, um, so they definitely came from two very different worlds. Yeah. And, um, my dad was kind of, was throwing himself out of, you know, New York, the, the, the devastation of New York that was happening in the seven, like early seventies. Um, I mean, it was, it was rough. And I remember yeah. him telling me as a child, you know, I'm either seeing my friends go to jail, be killed, die of drug, you know, get caught up in drug situations or whatever. And I need to, I need to. I need to get out to give myself a chance is Mm -hmm. how he felt. He really, really felt that. So then he's plopped in the middle of the snow in the Midwest where he went to college and then met my mom. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're, you know, you're young and optimistic and in love, um, you're ready to face the world, no matter the challenges, Mm -hmm. but then when the challenges actually hit, it's, it's a, it's a real thing. So, you know, um, they faced a lot. And they protected us from a lot. You know, as you grow up, your parents start revealing more things to you. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're like, wait, what? I, you know, just total shock. Um, my parents, a- after they were married in Michigan, they moved back, obviously. And they, so I was born in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn was, you know, this is 1980. Okay. And it was not what it is now. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean... Um, this is when crack was, you know, planted into the, it was taking over, yeah. you know, and it was, it was devastating. Mm-hmm. Um, and my family's from the projects. We lived in the projects there mm-hmm. and, you know, here's my mom culture shock, <laughs> can we say? Right. So, you know, um, my dad was kind of accepted in his culture shock moment in the, in Michigan. He actually went there on a basketball scholarship. So he's like. The, you know, the star basketball. Right. Mm-hmm. And then take her, throw her into that situation. And, um, there was even, you know, it, a it lot. Was, it, yeah. was dark. it was a lot. Our upbringing is often a quest for identity. For those who are biracial, navigating the quest of identity is not only unique and challenging, but in a lot of cases, it feels like an endless journey. Let's jump back in my conversation with Shannon. So (laughs) tell us a little bit about that journey and the discovery. And I think you you were just saying like, you know, there was this fear of saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And so I want you just to delve into that a little bit more. Um, what has this journey been like as it relates to your identity and um, the fullness that makes you Shannon? It's continuing. The journey is continuing for one. And I've you know accepted that and I'm excited about it. Questioning, you know, as, especially as a young child and trying to figure out how to def- define my identity. Um, biracial and multiracial people have kind of been boxed in racially um, for very hurtful and sensitive reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, I had to get to a point I was okay. And I was confident enough to say, this is who I am. And this is, this is my identity to say I'm a biracial black woman, not just biracial or just black. Um, both are important to me to say. 
People of color, biracial or not, are faced with racism based on learned biases that are a byproduct of racism. The vehicle for this form of overt and covert racism is fleshed out through perceptions or aesthetics. This is most evident with colorism. How a biracial person is perceived aesthetically on both sides of their heritage yields privilege. At the same time, some of those perceptions yield penalties. Let's hear about Letitia's experience. What I also say about being biracial, half white and half black, how many of us, and I'll speak for myself and my sisters because we've had this conversation, I think many times we felt like we had the best of both worlds many times because though I might have gone to an all white school, an all black school, and I typically tended to be the one that looked the most different of everyone, at the same time, when I went to the all white school, I had the best tan and all the girls wanted my tan, right? And I went to the all black school, they said I had the good hair, right? And so you tend to feel like, man, I got the best of both worlds. And so maybe the same um, negative experiences that either one of those cultures have, maybe I'm immune to them. Let's hear Shannon expound on the same subject. Growing up in the 80s, and this is why we said, okay, we have got to be part of this conversation because this is a group that not that we're more special than anybody. Right, (laughs) right. We're just saying that this is a a specific generation in America. You know, like some of the things that you you dealt with where, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe um, some groups thought, hey, you're too light or Mm -hmm. you're too dark or, you know, what what defines good hair? You know, Mm -hmm. like good hair isn't necessarily (laughs) curly hair or, you know what I'm saying? But just how these, um, these, um, these supremacist type ideologies that we've taken in and ingested Mm -hmm. um, within our community and haven't even, um, you know, know, really discussed that and and what that is and what defines beauty, um, you know, versus dark skin, light skin and all these different things. And so that's a whole nother conversation as it, you know, relates to, I know um, some families that are biracial like yourself, Mm -hmm. where, you know, they have, um, you know, maybe one child um, is a lighter and maybe they have blue eyes. And so there's going to be some privileges that come with that and talking about that but then maybe another child has darker skin and and brown eyes that you know even how both of their brothers and sisters or sisters are are two brothers but the how they navigate the world is going to be different for one than the other Mm -hmm. and how they present and you know um and that's not the same in a white family you know having a child with red hair and blonde hair you know you know what i'm saying there's no comparison in in this as it relates to colorism um but that happens a lot right. i have a friend who is native american and her husband is white and she actually is biracial mm-hmm. um but she presents more of a darker native and right. two of her children present darker right and one daughter you wouldn't you wouldn't know unless she told you and so but she's experienced how her brother has to navigate navigate, navigate. Navigating this can be complicated. First, there is an understanding what it means to be biracial. Then there are ancillary effects to being biracial based on how you present. Now let's dig into a bit of terminology. What is the proper way to identify someone who is biracial? Shannon addressed this. You know, my dad ended up into a career of uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity and um, in the corporate sector. and. You know, we just, I think as a family, we just embraced this whole entire (laughs) world Uh of, okay, um, you know, whatever. I I mean, people were not, a lot of the language we hear now, they were not talking about this when I was growing up, you know? Uh Um, So, and and let me back up to even like the mixed dish, like you were saying, was that how we call, you know, I mean, when I first heard that the title, I was kind of cringing a little. Right, right. My, my dad raised us to say, you're not mixed. You're not dogs, right. mutts, and whatever, you know. Um, you're biracial. And he was very, you know, we're African-American and biracial, you know, very, that was the term that he really wanted to embrace. So, um, but I mean, culture, you know, kind of takes over those things sometimes. <laughs> Right, so right. I'd rather embrace it and empower it than just keep fighting against this whatever machine. I mean, just how black people we go, we've gone from Negro to this and that. And, you know, there's yeah. another layer 
Because as a biracial person, understanding who you are, codifying, identifying, terminology, and working through how you present is one thing. As a parent of a biracial child, there is yet another layer. I think Letitia helps us to understand the complexities of these dilemmas, but also gives insight on how to address these dilemmas. Let's take a listen. We, we try to do the same, obviously, with our boys. So my husband, um, ironically, is also biracial. He is mixed also. So his father actually was Creole as well. Um, he actually was dark-skinned Creole, but he had blue eyes. And his mother was white and Native American. I think she was Irish and Native American. And he has five brothers and sisters, or you know, total, five siblings. And every single one of them have a different eye color and skin tone. And in fact, you know, one of his brothers whose wife is blonde hair and white, their daughter looks after, I mean, she's blue, blue eyes, bl- blonde, curly hair. She doesn't look like she has an ounce of black blood in her. My boys, on the other hand, having children with a biracial male, our boys look mixed slash black. Like, you know, depends on, depends on where, what, you know, what, what part of America you're in. Some may pick up on that they're biracial because of their hair texture and, you know, tone and others, they may say, well, you look black. So, um, but yeah, our boys, which, you know, I remember just having that same feeling when I went with my oldest son, who's now 16, when I went to go fill out the school form for him and asked his race, I mean, I, I, I wanted to cry really, Tasha. I, I didn't know because I'm thinking, I mean, my husband and I knew like, okay, you know, you pick black because that's what most people would think. But, you know, our mom's white right. and we, we knew we could put black slash white, but he has two biracial parents. So what do you put for a biracial, biracial oh, child? You know? Oh my goodness. When this is white. Yeah. Yeah. What? Right? We, we, wow. You know, and, and, and all my cousins now who have, you know, husbands that are Hispanic and, I mean, like all my, gr- my grandmother's children now are so biracial. There is no way you can really pick a race for them. Right. You and know, it's like you don't want to pick other. Like, I don't want to pick know, other. Who yeah. wants to choose other? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Who wants to choose other? You know. So I think one of my sisters finally just started picking other because she's like, I, "This is just too much." I, at this point, it doesn't uh-huh. matter. You know. So yeah, but right. So, um, but yeah, what we teach our boys is again w- what we believe is first and foremost like know who you are, know the promises of God, and there is going to be obstacles and trials that you have to overcome in this earth and people are going to try to discourage you and hurt you and divide you even if it's to do with race or has to do with you know a thousand other things that we deal with here on this earth um but ultimately we love to affirm our boys in their identity that we love their skin color we love their hair um you know and i think even just like practical things of affirming their identity like making sure my boys have really good lotion so that they don't go to school with ashy knees, right? Because mm-hmm. they do go to a school that is predominantly white. And the last mm-hmm. thing I need to do is send my kid to school that ashy knees and legs and he's ma- being made fun of. Like it's, I think many mm-hmm. times it's these practical things and making sure that I take the time to find the right hair products because again, they're biracial, biracial at this point. And let me tell you, there are no hair products out there that really can understand just the multitude of DNA that you know god has put in us and so one has textured hair more another one has a little bit more fuzzier hair and and you know there's nothing that really fits them perfectly but you know just trying to you know figure that out but really just affirming their identity and, and how intelligent they are and how proud of we are from um of, of who they are before they even have you know accomplished really anything they're both really great athletes and so um you know we affirm their identity and their in their you know and their academics and their athletics um but ultimately teaching them that, hey, there's evil in the world and there may be people who judge you based on the skin color or even where you live or, or where you're from, or how you speak. Um, but that's never going to hold you down and hold you back from the ultimate purpose and identity that God has for you. And you're, if you don't allow it to, you can allow mm-hmm. it to, if that's where you're going to find your identity. If you find your identity in people, man, we'll never make it in life. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, but yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah. And then their experiences. So, you know, they play sports. So they play, you know, basketball and they they played golf with my husband and they run track and they play um, soccer. And so each of those sports too bring, you know, very different, you know, ethnic groups as well, right? So they're playing basketball where majority of their teammates are black, but then they go play golf where a majority of their teammates are not. And they mm-hmm. play soccer where they have more Hispanic teammates and then trying to make sure they have diverse experiences in school with, you know, drama and, um, you know, 
honor classes and just different experiences so that they can appreciate and know who they are and, and love other people as well. I'm sure for some of you, your landing spot for all of this is reconciliation. But it's interesting where the direction of our conversations went. I love what Shannon says here. Well, I would definitely say don't, yeah, you have not arrived to any place just because you have now had black children or biracial children Mm -hmm. um, to a place, when I say arrived to any place of now you're not, you know, eliminated from having biases or being racist or now you're all of a sudden educate, like dive into educating yourself about the background of your child's race. Mm. That's what I would say. I would say now you are going to get a master's in your child's <laughs> race. That's, right. That's what I would say. Because, um, yeah, I think there there's definitely some assumptions. To be honest, that is something that we all can do. We should all dive in and learn more about the people who are around us. We can all do our own research by reading and also Googling. Before we go, I had one more question for Leticia. What is one thing that you wish that people understood about um, your experience? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, with being biracial, Mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, a lot of what we've talked about is that you don't live a life where you have to come in and automatically side with one side or the other. Mm-hmm. You have lived a life of finding a way to walk in unity. Mm. You have found a way to accept people for who they are, their differences, their, you know, their good and their bad and make a way to still be in relationship with them, to truly love them. Love them, love them, love them. Can I ask you a question? Of course, anytime. Why is being different so hard? We come from a place where everyone was treated the same, no matter what they look like. But that's not how it works here for so many complicated reasons. But we have a choice not to let that affect who we are. You are different, I am different. So is your mom. That's what makes us special. And I promise you that one day you'll realize that being different is your superpower. Is your superpower. Is your superpower. Is your superpower. Are you really ready to truly love one another? Maybe that means being willing to take the extra step and learn more about one another's heritage and culture and things that make us different and also the same. Let's not box people into our place of comfort, even those who come from multiple cultural backgrounds. These two conversations were just a start. We're going to dive back into this topic on being biracial in future episodes. I want to thank Letitia and Shannon for their honesty and transparency as they helped us to try to understand what it means to be biracial in America. That's all for today. But again, let's become more willing to show love for one another by taking the extra step to learn more about one another. We did a little bit of that today. Until next time, build bridges and not walls. In the next episode, you'll hear... What is it when we cannot let go of adoration? Of course, you know, I, my friend always says to me, why you got to stir the pot all the time? <laughs> I did, that you could study that hard and be as mean as yes. nice. Thanks for listening to the Be The Bridge podcast. To find out more about the Be The Bridge organization and or to become a bridge builder in your community, go to bethebridge.com. Again, that's bethebridge.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, remember to rate and review it on this platform and share it with as many people as you possibly can. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's show was edited and produced by Trayvon Potts at Integrated Entertainment Studios in Metro Atlanta, Georgia. The host and executive producer is Latasha Morrison. Lauren C. Brown is the senior producer. This podcast was recorded by Josh Dang with additional editing by Roshane Ricketts. Brittany Prescott was our transcriber. Please join us next time. This has been a Be The Bridge production. Be The Bridge, 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 Be The Bridge.